Good morning and welcome to session two of our series on putting fear in its place. I'm glad you're here today because I'm going to give you biblical reasons why you should never despair or be despondent. John Bunyan wrote of his pilgrim journey, which included having to walk through the swamp of despondency. Or if you're reading in the original, it's a slew of despond where he was in jail because he had devilishly and pertinaciously abstained from going to ch coming to church to hear divine service and was a common upholder of unlawful meetings and co conventicles to the great disturbance and distraction of the good subjects of this kingdom contrary to the laws of our sovereign Lord, the King. Now, here's what that charge was based on. John Bunyan read the Bible with a few people in a barn. He was a Puritan, and because he preached the gospel rather than the Anglican doctrine, doctrine of the Church of England, he was labeled a criminal and spent some 12 years in Bedford Jail in England where he steadfastly clung, clung to the biblical tendency so loved refusing time after time to recant his beliefs until Quakers pled with the king to release some of their members. And they included Bunyan's name on their list, and he was pardoned and freed. What we studied today and learned to put fear in his place, John Bunyan experienced in Bedford Jail on bread and water for 12 years. Yet his love of Christ Jesus gave him reason for hope and rescue. Many of us live with a sense of insecurity. We may feel insecure in our work or relationships, but the greatest area of insecurity for so many is their relationship with God. Sins, circumstances, and doubts can persuade people that their relationship with God is no longer secure. The book of Romans helps us see that this greatest of fears is nothing at all to fear for the Christ follower. Are you like Christian in John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress? Christian was left to tumble in the swamp of despondence alone, but he continued his efforts toward the side of the swamp, still further away from his own house and in the direction of the narrow gate. He continued to struggle but could not get out because of the burden on his back. John Bunyan, 1678. Because of Christ, nothing will keep us from God and his work in our lives. The worldly wise men of the lands of the world the legalist and the moralist have nothing that will please the Lord and help us carry our burdens through those times of despair and trouble that all Christians face from time to time. It's on Christ and his bride to help us along the narrow way to the narrow gate where we will be relieved of our heavy and worrisome burden to rejoice in God's presence forever. Paul's letter to the Romans has had enormous impact on the life, doctrine, and history of Christianity. Written in the late A.D. 50s, Paul addressed the church in Rome to clarify for them key doctrines of the gospel. He also wanted to visit them personally on his way to preach in Spain. In Romans, Paul emphasized that salvation is only through faith in Christ. In this section, he assured the church in Rome that their salvation was secure. Today, it's imperative that we immerse ourselves in study of the Bible, prayer, and good works, love for the lost and love for the saved, but most importantly, love for our Creator and Father, Almighty God. Let's take a look at the first point in our, in our lesson. The Bible says, uh, we, we know all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined 
to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. The word predestined in verse 29 refers to God's ordaining salvation for those individuals whom he foreknew, even before the creation of the world. The root word means to pre-establish boundaries. I understand this verse to mean that God knew who he would create before he ever created us, and he would establish rules for which, for which we are to live by. Throughout the Old Testament, the law is handed down to Moses, were the rules to obey to be in right standing with God. But there's prophecy about Christ and what he would do to put us in right standing with the Father. In the New Testament, we find the fulfillment of these prophecies and Jesus' insistence that the walk of the redeemed includes obeying the commandments. And then we look also in verse 29 at the word firstborn. That word is really a term that demonstrates to us Jesus' superior position over all creation. This does not mean firstborn in the sense of chronological order, except as the first to rise from the dead. Just as Christ, who was the first to be brought out of the tomb without removing the stone, so shall we be second born to him when the church is raptured. <laughs> and then the word justified in verse 30. That's a legal term used for the Christian doctrine that God, by his grace, declares the believer righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. Christ in John 14, 6 declares that this is the only way to the Father. God has control over the circumstances of people's lives. But Paul attached two conditions to the promise. First, from the human side, it is for those who love God. Love for God is a natural result of the second condition that is from God's side. It is for those who are called according to his purpose. God's people love him because he gives them the undeserved gift of salvation by grace. Thus they are called by his spirit, to accept his gift, gift by faith in order to fulfill his good purpose. Jesus, as the firstborn over all creation, is the maker and ruler of the universe. He existed before everything, and, in, and everything in the heavens and the earth were created by him, according to Paul in Colossians 1, verses 15 through 17. He is also the firstborn from the dead who was first to be raised from the grave, never again to die. Revelation 1.5. Also verse 18 of our current scripture. Those who are his followers will share in his resurrection and his glory. Believers will be conformed to the image of his son. Paul assured his readers that those whom God justified, he also glorified. Glorification is the final, ultimate state of human salvation. Paul stated this future reality as a present fact for those who are justified. He wanted his readers to be confident that as God's redeemed people, they will be resurrected and changed into Christ's likeness and reside with him in heaven eternally. These verses set the stage for what Paul would say in the passages that follow. His goal was to give ultimate assurance to his readers of their secure standing before God. Indeed, all things do work together for the good of his redeemed people. For that reason, we should never fear. Moving along now to verses 31 through 34, we read, What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not all how will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? 
God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. God's elect are people chosen by God to follow him and accomplish his will in the world. Originally applied to the nation of Israel, but here used to describe Christ's redeemed people, the church. In verse 32, Paul speaks of two other essential theological principles. He first wrote that God did not even spare his own son. Out of his infinite love for humanity, God was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son, Jesus. Why? Because God gave him up for us all. For means on behalf of or for the sake of. The highest proof of God's love for mankind is the cross. Christ's sacrificial death made the ultimate payment for humanity's sin and the vindication of God's righteousness. Considering God's unequivocal willingness willingness to give up his most precious treasure, his own son, for the believers in Rome and for all those who would become believers, Paul asked another provocative question. How will he not also with him grant us everything? (laughs) The obvious conclusion is God will graciously do so. As believers, we can rest assured that God will provide for our security both now and forever under the protection brought or bought by Christ's sacrifice. Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? If the work of salvation was dependent in some way on people's actions or our feelings or religious duties, then perhaps we might be in jeopardy of allegations of infidelity to Christ. However, justification is not determined by our own resources. It is entirely the provision of God himself through all the sacrificial death of Christ. Believers did not earn it. They do not deserve it, and we will, ne- that most, most people, before they're saved, don't even want it. But by the relentless power of the Holy Spirit and God's grace, they were drawn inexorably, it's easy for you to say, to the cross and to saving faith. Faith. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Nothing or no one can take that away. Government, pagan religious leaders, or even the devil himself can bring seemingly legitimate, slanderous charges against God's people, but based on the irrefutable evidence Paul presented, and by deductive logic, the indisputable answer must be no one. The reason is obvious. God is the one who justifies. Paul's proof do not end. Even with Jesus' resurrection, he further declared that Christ also ascended into heaven where he is now at the right hand of God. The right hand of a king was the place of greatest honor. The image of Jesus sitting or standing at the Father's right side is seen in numerous passages in the New Testament. It is symbolic of his exalted heavenly place in the eternal triune Godhead. From that lofty position, that lofty location, Jesus intercedes for us. He, along with the Holy Spirit, John 14 through 16 and Romans 8, 26, is able to direct believers' entreaties to the Father. He makes their cases to the righteous judge like lawyers in court. All these principles presented here by the Apostle Paul make it clear that no one can condemn us before God. We need not fear because we have the absolute assurance that God is for us. Paul then made even more explicit 
the eternal consequences of our, of our relationship with God through Christ. Paul writes in verse 35, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This section of Paul's letter to the Romans is one of the strongest statements in the New Testament regarding the eternal security of the believer in Christ. Given all the facts that he had said thus far, he again posed another couple of rhetorical questions. He asked, who can separate us from the love of Christ? The doctrinal evidence he had presented should make the answer to this easy. God foreknew them, he predestined them, he called them, he justified them, and if and inevitably he will glorify them. And who is them? That's the people who believe in Christ and his finished work. And why can we do that? It's all because God gave his son for us. And so the answer to the question, who can separate us from the love of Christ? That answer is no one. Paul listed a few terrible life situations that one might think could disconnect us from Christ's love. He started with affliction or trouble. Then he mentioned distress or hardship. Next was persecution. Paul understood these problems were not mere hypothetical issues for his readers. They were already experiencing such issues in Rome from both, both religious and government entities. He then mentioned in a shortage of basic human needs that could hinder their, their lives. Famine was the lack of food or water due to harsh environmental factors or political incompetence. Nakedness referred to a lack of adequate clothing and shelter because of poverty or discrimination. None of these dire straits can separate us from God's care. Paul mentioned a couple of situations that resulted from man's cruelty to man. Danger is the threat of bodily harm or death. Robbery, theft, and murder were as pervasive in those days as they are today. The sword was the primary weapon of war or execution. Paul had himself experienced many per perils. The Roman Christians were no less subject to them too. Nonetheless, Paul encouraged the believers not to give in to their fears, but to look to God for their rescue. More and more it comes to my attention of the plight of Christians around the of the plight of Christians around the world and what they face in their daily walk. Paul cut no corners, nor did he hold back on delivering God's truth. Quoting Psalm 44, verse 22, he said, Because of you we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. The psalmist was humbly reminding God how the people of Israel, despite their faithfulness to him, still faced death from their enemies. Sometimes they felt like sheep headed for the butcher's block. Paul summarized this whole section of scripture with the final assertion that no one, no other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This assurance should dispel all fear for believers safe in the love of Christ. Many Christians in various parts of the world, even today, are suffering great dangers for their faith. Millions face harsh persecution from ungodly political regimes. Others face kidnapping and death from evil criminal elements. 
Still others are oppressed by and discriminate, discriminated against by adherents of intolerant religions. When suffering believers read these words from Paul, they have direct application to their lives. We never know what the future holds. But Christians, even in North America, may someday face stiff opposition. Whatever happens, we can rest in the assurance of God's love to assuage all our fears. Never forget, please never forget, nothing can separate us from God's love. Studying the Bible for the sake of knowing what it talks about is not enough. As Christians, we are to work out, we're to live out our faith. And so here's some suggestions for, to, for you to, to consider. Here's a question. What will you do with the truth that you're securing Christ? Well, one thing you can do is to memorize Scripture. Why would you memorize Scripture? What, why is that important? Well, you get your security in Christ ingrained in your mind. Memorize Romans 8, 37 through 39. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Recite it daily. Post it on your bathroom mirror. Keep it before your eyes and fresh on your tongue. And then encourage other people. God encourages us with his written word. So what should we do? We might all write an encouraging note to someone who may be struggling with insecurity in their relationship with Christ. Use what we've studied as a template to encourage this person. And then we're all ministers. In some religious factions, a minister is the person who stands on the pulpit and has the uh, responsibility of leading the church. But ministry doesn't stop there. You may be sensing God calling you to serve in some way. Oh, boy. And when that happens, yeah, if you have a fear of failure, it makes you hesitant. Rest on your foundation in Christ and step out in trustful obedience. Trust him to work in you and through you for your own good. Paul sums up Romans chapter 8 with these words. For I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In the last chapter of the Pilgrim's Process, one of the characters in the book, Mr. Standfast, says, I have formerly lived by hearsay and faith, but now I'm going where I live by sight, and I will be with him in whose company I delight myself. Help us, Lord, to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage in this evil world as we make our way to the celestial city where we will enter by the narrow gate. We make this our prayer in the sweet name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I'm Ben Perry, and I invite you to join me again next week as we learn to replace fear with love. Until then, walk where Jesus walks, speak what Jesus speaks, and may the love of God and neighbor be the hallmark of your life.